Welcome, my friends, to the Bob and Brad podcast produced by Bob and Brad, the two most famous physical therapists on the internet. I am Bob and I exactly one half of the Bob and Brad team. Today, my guest is Patrick McCowan, who is, I'm just going to put it very simply because he does go over his background. He is the expert on breathing. And you think, oh, I know how to breathe. I'm, I'm breathing. I'm alive. You're going to be amazed at how it can affect your life as far as anxiety and sleep and digestion. And I mean, it just goes on and on uh, the, the how it affects your health if you're doing it improperly. And most of us are. And I have been uh, on this journey for at least a year now in trying to improve my breathing. And I have a ways to go, but it has made a big effect, uh, has had a big effect on my life. Welcome to the program, Patrick McCowan. Thanks very much, Bob. Good to be so, here. Yeah, great to have you. Um, again, as I was mentioning to you off uh, screen here, um, really a topic of interest of mine is breathing. Um, maybe we would start best be start uh, be starting by uh, having you cover your backstory. You know how you became interested in breathing in your training. Sure. Um, I was a kid growing up with asthma, as many kids do. And I always had chronic nasal obstruction, which is very common with asthma because the lungs is not isolated to the nasal airway. It's one airway. So whatever is happening in one aspect of the airway travels up and vice versa. Mm -hmm. And with that, when you have a stuffy nose, you're more liable to have sleep problems. So I had undiagnosed obstructive sleep apnea and I didn't realize it was only about 20 years later. But I remember as a kid and as a teenager and into, into university, I was very much caught for breath. I was taking quite a lot of rescue medication. I had a couple of hospitalizations with asthma. But I think that the one thing that really got me was my fatigue. And when I was staying in student dorms, I spent a, a, one year in Erasmus in Sweden at the University of Uppsala. And the students told me that they could hear me snoring and I was stopping breathing. Really? But of course, I had no idea what that was. It was about four years later, three or four years later after I'd graduated, because even getting through high school and getting through university, it's tough going when you have sleep problems. Yes. And it's tough going when you have dysfunctional breathing. And that's seldom, I think, considered. But I wrote, was reading a newspaper article. It was about the work of a Russian doctor. His name is Konstantin Buteko. And he was talking about the importance of breathing in and out through the nose. And he was talking about the importance of breathing light. And I was doing neither of those things. I was a persistent mouth breather. And people would always hear me breathe. I was caught for breath, etc. So I started practicing his method. And it's not an exaggeration to say that when I started breathing less air, I could feel the temperature of my fingers increasing. Mm. And I always had cold hands and cold feet. But I also tried the nose unblocking exercise and I was able to decongest my nose, not perfectly, but it gave me quite a bit of relief. I started then making the transition from being a chronic mouth breather to a nose breather. I was feeling air hunger when I was making the switch over. Sure. I taped my mouth closed the first night, taped it closed, but I used breathe right strips to keep my nose open just in case. The first done, morning waking up. I've done up, the same, by the way. You've done Absolutely so, the same. And, you know, the first morning kind of waking up, just getting used to it. It was the second morning I woke up. It was the best night's sleep I had in about 15 years. So I think there's something really important, Bob, in recognizing that the role that the nose does in human health because it totally gets overlooked and when we think about breathing and nasal breathing i would always say that nasal breathing is the very foundation and on top of that then we can improve breathing patterns and i would also say that by changing breathing patterns you can influence major disciplines of health I agree 100%. You're preaching to the choir, choir because, um, yeah, I went through the same thing. I was a chronic uh, uh, mouth breather, and uh, you can probably see from the structure of my face. Um, I mean, 
So I started with the nasal strips and I found out later that I, I no longer needed them. I don't yeah. know if my, your body has, seems to adapt and uh, yes. structurally, and I haven't used them since, but I, I would, I would, even with the nasal, nasal strips kind of wake up like, I'm not getting enough air, you know? So yeah. Um, yes. yeah. This might be a good time to mention you actually uh, have a, uh, a form of tape. I'd be interested in this. Uh, I just use some, tape off the internet um sure uh, sure hyperallergenic tape we, which we were using for about 15 20 years mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. but it always came a problem when it came to children and teenagers because sure. about i would say about 50 percent of the work that i was doing for health 50 percent of people who are who i was working with were the youngsters and we really need to get them to get them out closed and the tongue resting in the roof of the mouth because mm -hmm. just as you alluded to, I have the same facial problems. And what it does is it's not just aesthetically that it's not as pleasing, even though I have to say you're a very handsome looking man, Bob. Yeah. <laughs> I just put that in now. <laughs> but where it really messes us up is it messes up our sleep. Yes, it does. Because when the jaws are set back and when the nostrils are pinched, and when the nasal cavity is infringed and when the mouth is open and the tongue is encroaching the airway and sleep is really important, that deep sleep for recovery. So yes. the tape, the tape is myotape and I'll do a demonstration of it. So the idea came for working with children and then we started noticing actually we became popular with adults. And I think it makes sense because a lot of people, when they hear about taping them out, they feel it's totally off the wall. And it's the one thing that we do that just seems a little bit off the wall, but the motive is good. And sorry, this is making a bit of noise now, so I'll just take it out. No, I, th I, I think uh, I was a little bit of the same uh, uh, mindset that uh, I was skeptical, uh, but it has been a game changer without a doubt. I mean, yeah. And I, I wear it throughout the day quite often when I'm working the at tape it. as well. Yes, because I'm, I'm in such a habit of trying to breathe yeah. through the nose. So this tape goes, now this is the medium size, the only one I can get my hands on. <laughs> so I'm going to stretch it just about 30%. Interesting. Oh, it's this... stretchable. It's elasticated. Yeah, that's way different. And it's pulling the lips together. So that sure. helps to maintain lip closure. And then people don't be apprehensive about it when it comes to sleep. And of course, children as well. So we have children wear it during wakefulness to get them transitioning to nasal sure. breathing. And, you know, once, once the child is well able to adopt to nasal breathing during the day, then we consider it during sleep under supervision. Um, but, you know, it's, it's just one of those things, if I was to say the one, the one tip that can offer the most is getting the mouth closed during sleep. Nobody should be waking up with a dry mouth in the morning. The sad thing is that most dentists will realize that their mouth breathing patients come in. They have more dental cavities, more gum disease, Absolutely. more bad breath. Absolutely. But yet, but yet most dentists don't always say to their patients to breathe through the nose, but many of them are. So it's starting to happen, but it hasn't yet came, became widespread. Right. I, I was never warned about that. And um, the thing I found, I didn't even realize this. I wasn't looking for it as my teeth are whiter. <laughs> I mean, they were yellowing yes. at night and, um, yeah. and yeah, it's funny. I have a dentist appointment coming up, so I'll be curious to see what they say, but um it's, it's just made a huge difference dental wise. <laughs> Crazy. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. your tape is by avail, uh, is available at oxygenadvantage.com and myotape.com and myotape.com. Yeah. So it's called myo because there's a, there's a discipline called myofunctional therapy. And the myofunctional therapist is some, somebody who often works with an orthodontist. Oh, sure. So when the child is mouth breathing, it's the mouth breathing that contributes to overcrowding of teeth. Yes. And orthodontics who are aware of airway and functional orthodontistry, they're not just wanting to fix and straighten teeth, but they also emphasize in terms of developing the airway 
and developing the face, but also addressing the bad habits which have led to overcrowding of teeth in the first instance. So it's a much different approach. So even in orthodontistry, there's two schools of thought and one is quite different to the other. And, and uh, you know, this has been an epidemic. I mean, yeah. as a society, you know, we're, we're developing these underdeveloped nasal passages and, yes. and uh, you know, overdeveloped jaws. I mean, to some extent, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And all you have to do is, just to get an idea of this, is to go into any primary school age, you know, young junior school, and ask the number of kids that are 11 years of age or 12 years of age who are embarking on orthodontic treatment. Sure, yes, and exactly. It's likely to be 75%, yes. or it could be even be higher. But overcrowding of teeth is not just pointing to the problem of the teeth, it's pointing to the fact that the jaw is too small. And when the jaw is too small, there's not enough room for the tongue. And when there's not enough room for the tongue, the tongue has only got one place to go, and that's back into the airway. And then this is increasing the risk of obstructive oh, sleep apnea for the rest of the life. Yeah, I misspoke. I, I My jaw is bigger on the bottom, but it's underdeveloped on the upper upper part. So that's what, what you must be talking about. So Well, it, it may be due to having a low tongue resting posture. Because it's the pressures exerted by the tongue which help to develop the, the maxilla. Sure. But if the mouth is open, the tongue is not able to rest in the roof of the mouth because the person is breathing through the mouth. So as a result, then the tongue is more likely to be midway or on the floor of the mouth. And then it could be that the tongue then is developing. A, it, well, it, not, it may not be necessarily actually that your, your lower jaw is too far forward. The problem is that the maxilla is not forward enough. Sure. If the maxilla yeah, was under, forward under enough. Too. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. I, I know the, it was one of the, early on in life, I went to a dentist and, and uh, it was actually a student training and, and she, she thought something was wrong with my jaw and she took pictures of it and everything because of the, so underdeveloped and the upper part. Yeah. So, yeah. Now you've written several books, um, and I've read two of them: uh, mm -hmm. "The Oxygen Advantage" and "The Breathing Cure." Um, would you like to just mention a, f a few of your books? And uh, they're available everywhere, I believe. Correct. Yes, yeah, Amazon. they're still available. And um, the first book I wrote, I suppose, when I started off teaching breathing in two thousand and two, nobody really wants to take me seriously, and Sure. You know, yeah. I was talking about the importance of nose breathing and the importance of breathing to change your biochemistry, etc. And I was putting it out there that, you know, at the time there were a couple of clinical trials using the buteyko method for asthma, but again, nobody really knew about it. And I didn't feel that the healthcare profession wants to know about it either. So I started writing my first book in 2002 and 2003 to get it out into the hands of the general population and to show them here are the exercises. So I simply just included every book. I've always included the exercises and let people practice it for themselves. Sure. And then they will know if there's truth in it by virtue of it works. Quite simple. Correct. Um, so the first book I wrote was a book called Close Your Mouth. So the title is kind of self-evident. And the second one then was Asthma Free Naturally. And the third one then was Always Breathe Correctly, ABC. So that was for young children. So it was full color. And then I wrote a book with an orthodontist in 2010 called Buteco Meets Dr. Mew. And Dr. Mew now is about 92 or 93 years of age. Mm. But for 50 years, he has been instructing his patients, mouth closed, tongue resting in the roof of the mouth. And he says, if you can get your mouth closed and your tongue resting in the roof of the mouth, there is no job for me because when your mouth is closed and your tongue is in the roof of the mouth, nature is going to in ensure that the development of your face is the way it should be. Now, unfortunately, he got a little bit ridiculed by his peers. But now people are starting to realize that what he has been saying for 50 years has actually been correct. Oh, correct. So I wrote that book back in 2010. I used to go over to his clinic in London and they gave me permission to sit down on the couch while they were working with their patients. 
and his son Mike Muir. There would be great banter going across. And yeah, so I thought it was a, you know, it was really getting that insight. And then I wrote a book called Sleep with Buteco, looking at the application of breathing for the pheno. Well, it wasn't phenotypes of sleep apnea back then because that's new, but sleep apnea. Anxiety free was another one. And I remember going around Ireland between 2010 and 2013, I was giving these kind of small workshops. There was a lot of anxiety here because it was the post economic crash and a lot of people losing jobs and houses were devalued and all of that stuff. And 3000 people attended small workshops that I was giving over a three year period. But about 90 to 95 percent of people who attended were female. And I couldn't help wondering why are there are no males coming in here? Males didn't want to come into a breathing workshop. And what I had done is I'd combined functional breathing and mindfulness because I don't I think mindfulness, I think, is absolutely wonderful. But I, I feel it's really, really, really falling short of the mark. And I'll talk about that in a while. But I decided, Dan, that we needed to have a breathing technique that's all about improving performance because a lot of men are not going to go into a bookstore and walk out with a book with anxiety under their sleeve. Right. Because right. maybe, you know, men are men and that's the way it is. And, but they'd be happy to walk out with a book called the oxygen advantage because sure. it was all about sports performance. Yes. But the very tools that we were using to generate flow states are the same tools that we use to bring a quietness to the mind and help reduce anxiety of the mind. And you know, it worked and now the oxygen advantage. So just, it's amazing how things kind of evolve. And I think it's very important. The language that we use as well in how we're wanting to achieve an objective. And, you know, because it can really make the difference between something that is embraced or something that's rejected. Right. It makes a difference on compliance for a yes. lot of people. So just circling back here now, uh, would you say the epidemic of asthma is in large part due to the breathing techniques? With asthma, it's very difficult to pinpoint what's the exact reason why, you know, there's so much asthma out there. It's been an explosion. It has. Yeah. And it's been increasing for decades and very much so in the countries with English speaking. So we're talking about Australia, New Zealand. Oh, the United Kingdom and Ireland, the USA and Canada. And it seems to be in that order, at least it was really for, for many years. And it's not necessarily due to pollution because the, the countries with the highest instance of pollution in the world don't have the highest asthma rates. Sure. And this was realized back in, you know, East and West Germany prior to unification. So say, for example, you can imagine the early 80s, in Eastern Germany, that real heavily heavy industrial plant, yes. a lot of pollution. Yes. West Germany was very modernized in comparison, but the asthma rates in West Germany were, were higher than the asthma rates in East Germany. Mm. And then with unification, the asthma rates then started to to soar then in East Germany. Oh. So there's I I'm not sure if anybody really knows, but the one thing that asthma increases relative to wealth now. We're eating more processed foods. I think it's all of the same factors. Um, I think there's a lot of chronic stresses. And, you know, when you're thinking about the child as well, the child is going to pick up on the stress of the parents. Yes, they are. And even that the heart rate variability of the child is actually determined by the mother. So this can actually happen while while the baby is in the womb in terms of if you have a mother who's anxious and... um, you know, experiencing high stress, this will actually impact the vagal tone of the young infant. Wow. Now, the one thing about vagal tone is that you can influence it. Um, but I suppose here is the recognition, Bob. People with asthma breathe too much air. They typically breathe faster, they breathe harder, and they breathe upper chest. And many healthcare professionals will recognize that, yes, this is how a person with asthma breathes. And they would say, it's the narrowing of the airways which is causing dysfunctional breathing. And right. okay, there's merit there. But it neglects to recognize that the dysfunctional breathing is feeding back into the narrowing of the airways. Sure. That there's a feedback loop there. And that's really what I wanted to try and connect. And 
like I remember when I switched from mouth to nose breathing and did breathing exercises to breathe light and slow down my breathing. And in terms of the airways, the, the natural theory is that when you breathe through your nose, you pick up a gas called nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is antiviral, it's antibacterial. Nitric oxide also assists with redistribution of blood throughout the lungs. And it's known since 1988 that the pressure of oxygen in the blood is 10% higher with nasal breathing than with mouth breathing. Now, despite this, how many people with asthma are going around with their mouth open? Not 100% of the time, but if they go for a walk, if they go to the gym, they're sleeping with their mouths open at night. Right. They can have their mouths open when they are distracted. And with asthma, you don't just have inflammation of the lungs. You have also inflammation of the nose. And with inflammation of the nose, it doesn't feel comfortable breathing through the nose. So it's inevitable that the person is going to breathe through the mouth. Mouth breathing is taking cold, dry, unfiltered air into the airways. And this is going to cause airway narrowing. So it really just makes sense because when it comes to the human mouth and the nose, if we were to ask the question, if I was to look into somebody's mouth and if I was to ask what part of the mouth is devoted exclusively to breathing, the answer is that there is no part of the mouth. The mouth has absolutely no function when it comes to breathing. The mouth is simply a hole. So it's an entry point that air can go straight down the throat. It's the nose that does all the work. And even in posture and in balance, in functional movement, in recruitment of the diaphragm, in oxygen uptake, in oxygen delivery, in slow breathing, because slow breathing too during rest and during sleep is very important for balance of the autonomic nervous system. So we should be seeing mouth breathing as as an emergency response. You know, traditionally throughout our evolution, our ancestors breathed through their mouth when they were in fight or flight. But now we are breathing through the mouth chronically, and that's going to increase in sympathetic drive. And the problem with that is that chronic stress physiologically contributes to inflammation. So there's so many different links. And the other thing about mouth breathing is that it's known that the resistance to your breathing during wakefulness, when you breathe through your nose, your nose does impose a resistance to your breathing. That's about two to three times that of the mouth. But this is beneficial because it's slowing down the air. It's giving sure. enough time for oxygen to transfer from the lungs to the blood. Nasal breathing, when you're breathing through the nose, it's helping to add an extra load onto the diaphragm. This may help to maintain good diaphragmatic tone and good function of the diaphragm. But mouth breathing during sleep is what causes resistance. So when you breathe through your mouth during sleep, your mouth imposes a resistance to your breathing that's 2.5 times that of the nose. You want resistance to your breathing during the day, but you don't want resistance to your breathing during sleep. So people who wake up at a dry mouth in the morning, they're more likely to experience insomnia because of the faster breathing and the upper chest breathing snoring and obstructive sleep apnea and a recent paper even in the larger scope it was published in may of 2020 looked at 95 individuals with established obstructive sleep apnea those who were mouth breathing had double the ahi double the severity of sleep apnea versus the nasal breathing only group now what does poor sleep do well that's also going to put us into increased sympathetic drive so in terms of, you know, the autonomic nervous system, that when we have a physiology that we're in that fight or flight and our sleep is off, it can really then impact other functions of the body. And this is the one thing that breathing has, because when we can change breathing patterns, we can change states. We can help to bring a balance in the autonomic nervous system. We can help to stimulate the vagus nerve. We can help to strengthen the sensitivity or strengthen the baroreflex. And we can help, you know, with that balance then. And it, this comes across a number of conditions, including diabetes, including epilepsy, including obstructive sleep apnea, but also PTSD, anxiety, depression, panic disorder, irritable bowel syndrome, 
um, asthma, COPD, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, and even now working with people with long COVID. And I have to say, when I hear sometimes people say, well, your COVID is COVID and there's no problem at all. And like, I'm not going to do any scaremongering. But if you actually see people who are trying to recover from long COVID, you will re- realize that this is a tough, tough condition. Yes, it is. Yes, and, it is. you know, I've seen and I worked with many people with chronic fatigue syndrome over the years. Chronic f- fatigue syndrome can be a tough condition, but co- long COVID is worse. And um, would you say uh, now, would you talk about uh, running when you run? Yes. Uh, I know that people can train themselves to still breathe through the nose when they're running. But when you have a high intensity running, uh, sprinting, I mean. Switch to mouth breathing. Yeah, it's switch to mouth breathing. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But for long distance, um, you can get to the point where you, I mean, I found now what I do is I breathe in through the nose and out through the mouth. Yeah, I, I'm not able to breathe back and forth. It's just not enough for me. But uh, yeah, Na- nasal breathing during running for the recreational ac- athletes, we would always say, do your best to breathe in and out through your nose. It just doesn't make sense to be mouth breathing during physical exercise because mouth breathing is typically fast and shallow breathing. There's increased dead space. So you're not actually you're not ventilating the the small air sacs in the lungs as readily as you would with nasal breathing. With with nasal breathing also, you've got better recruitment of the diaphragm and optimal movement of the diaphragm is necessary for the generation of intra-abdominal pressure because the diaphragm breathing muscle is not just for respiration, but it also provides stabilization for the spine. And 50% of people with lower back pain have dysfunctional breathing. So in terms of when people think even of core strength, they're thinking of strengthening and working the abs, but the abs, of course, are only got one part of it. And we have to think of the core as a box. You've got the diaphragm as the roof. You've got the pelvic floor. You've got the spinal muscles and you've got the, you've got the abs to the front. Sure. And functional breathing plays a role with that. So functional breathing and functional movement go together. Now, when you do physical exercise with your mouth closed, your nose is also protecting your airway. So we spoke about, you know, asthma, exercise induced asthma, because your nose is moistening and warming the incoming air. And the air is coming in filtered into the lungs. And it's at the perfect, you know, condition for oxygen transfer to take place. But also when you breathe through your nose during physical exercise, it's a little bit tougher. And the reason that it's more difficult is that nasal breathing will lead to an increase of carbon dioxide in the blood because carbon dioxide number one is going to be produced from your metabolism when you're going for your run you've got an increased metabolic rate you're working your muscles harder those muscles are producing more carbon dioxide with nose breathing the carbon dioxide is not able to leave the body quickly enough through the nose because the nose is a smaller exit than the mouth And as a result, carbon dioxide increases in the blood during physical exercise. But as carbon dioxide increases in the blood, the blood vessels dilate. And also, as carbon dioxide is increasing in the blood, hemoglobin, which is the main carrier of oxygen, releases more oxygen to those working muscles. If we ordinarily do our physical exercise with the mouth open, our breathing, our ventilation will increase proportionately to carbon dioxide production. So even though we are producing more carbon dioxide during physical exercise, if you have the mouth open, the carbon dioxide in the blood does not increase. But if you do your physical exercise with your mouth closed, you get the benefit of the increased carbon dioxide and drop to blood pH. You've got improved vasodilation, so you've got improved blood circulation as we spoke about, but more importantly, you've got improved oxygen delivery to the working muscles, better recovery. And that was, the, that was the biggest uh, surprise to me in your book is that, you know, CO2 is good and that yes. you, you really want to have it uh, working and, and that over breathing is really a problem. Yeah. You know, I think we all have, like, I remember going into an exam, going back, 
don't know when it was, 95, 1996. And I was pretty anxious going in because I was a chronic mouth breeder anyway, upper chest breeder. Mm-hmm. And about four minutes before I went into the exam hall, I took a walk. And during this walk, I took these full big breaths because exactly. that's what I believed. Exactly. And that's what I and would I, do. And I walked into the exam hall and I was totally spaced out. I never realized it at the time that the more air you breathe, you're not improving blood flow and oxygen delivery. You're literally depriving the brain of oxygen, but you're not just depriving the brain of oxygen. You're depriving the body of oxygen. There is a myth out there, the myth of the value of taking a big breath. And unfortunately you hear it in so many places oh, you hear absolutely. it in the media, in the movies. And yes. it just does Take not make breath. sense. Yes. Yeah. But I suppose, what is a deep breath? You know, a deep breath in the true sense of the word basically just means that you have recruitment of the diaphragm. That if you were to have your hands either side of your lower ribs, and as you breathe in, you should feel the lower ribs moving out. But you can have a very light and a slow deep breath. You know, you don't have to take a full breath to take a deep breath. So the the instruction to take a deep breath is correct. But the interpretation of the deep breath is incorrect. Right. And in a young infant baby is actually naturally deep breathing. You know, they have their, their mouth is closed. They're breathing in and out through the nose. And their breathing is primarily driven by the diaphragm. And that is natural. A dog, you know, when the dog doesn't have his mouth open, when it's not so hot outside, mm-hmm. for example, the cat, all animals pretty much are breathing with optimal movement of the diaphragm. But the human being, and it's probably due to, you know, certainly a contribution of chronic stress, trauma, but even excess of talking, you know, do you think our ancestors were talking for four or five hours or six hours a day continuously? You know, can you imagine, can you imagine some guy sitting around a cave fire (laughs) and this guy, this guy doesn't stop talking for four or five or six hours? He'd have driven everybody loony. Right, right. So we didn't do it as part of our evolution, but now we we do it as part of our job. And people don't realize that if you are talking for four or three hours even a day, that's increasing the respiratory rate. It's increasing the tidal volume. It's causing you to breathe more air. And the more air you breathe, it's reducing blood flow and oxygen delivery to the brain. And that's why we are so tired if we talk for prolonged periods of time. That was but really unfortunately, a hard concept for me to understand. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it really was. but you know what? I suppose a good way to test it out is actually do the opposite. You know, sure. like if, if somebody was sitting there and I would say to them, what I would like you to do is really slow down the speed of the air coming into your nose and then have a, such a soft and slow and relaxed and gentle exhalation. And as you breathe in, can you breathe in through your nose almost that you can hardly feel any air coming into your nose? So you're breathing in so subtly that the fine hairs within the nostrils do not move. And during the exhalation, you're having such a prolonged and relaxed and a slow and gentle exhalation. And as you do that, it's likely that you will feel a need for air. Yes. And the need for air is signifying the carbon dioxide is increased in the blood. But as carbon dioxide increases in the blood, the blood vessels dilate. So I suppose a trick for any of your listeners listeners is, if you practice breathing less air for four minutes, are you able to influence the temperature of your fingers? And as you do that, pay attention to the saliva in your mouth. Because very often, that even though you will feel an air hunger, and the air hunger should be tolerable, it shouldn't be stressful, If you find the air hunger stressful, of course, take a rest. But as you gently soften and slow down and breathe less air into your body, carbon dioxide is increasing in the blood because it cannot leave the body so quickly through the lungs. This will help improve your blood circulation, but also your oxygen delivery. But it also stimulates the vagus nerve. And the vagus nerve is innervating all of the the major organs And 80 to 90% of the communication of the vagus nerve is from the body up to the brain. When there's an increase in carbon dioxide in the blood, it stimulates the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve secretes acetylcholine, a neurotransmitter, 
and this causes a slowing of the heart and the brain interprets then that the body is safe and the brain will send signals of calm to the body. So when you practice breathing a little bit less air for about three or four minutes, check the saliva in your mouth. And if you have increased watery saliva in your mouth, it's telling you that your body is ready for the digestion of food. When we are ready for the digestion of food, we are in a state of relaxation. And conversely, when we are stressed, our mouth goes dry. Makes and sense. I suppose the one thing about this, Bob, is that I was listening to a podcast by Dr. Rangan Chatterjee. He was interviewing a brain surgeon, Dr. Rahul. And the brain surgeon said, he said, if I get into a tricky situation, now you can imagine a brain surgeon getting into a tricky situation. Right. It's not, that's, it, there's not going to be too many, you know, more trickier situations right. than that. That's but pretty much that's absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And he said, he said, if I get into a tricky situation, he said, the first thing I do is prevent myself from hyperventilating. And he said, people think that I'm born with nerves of steel. And I said, of, like I was thinking to myself, of course, this, of course, this doctor knows this, but why doesn't everybody else know it? Why right. doesn't the young kid in school know it? Why doesn't the university student, the corporate worker know it, the family person? We all need to know this, that we can change our state. And if I was to say to somebody listening, you know, if you were to take one thing out of this, when you think of the breath coming into your nose and the breath leaving the nose, it's not so much the inhalation that determines the relaxation response. It's the exhalation. If you breathe out fast during rest, it's a stressor. And the brain interprets that the body is under trash. But if you breathe in soft through your nose, and if you breathe out really slowly through your nose, the brain interprets that the body is safe and the brain sends signals of calm. So the next time that you are in a difficult situation, bring some attention onto your breathing. Nobody will know you're doing it. Take a soft breath in through your nose and have a really slow and relaxed and prolonged exhalation. Because this way, the body is telling the brain that everything is okay. And then you will be better able to, to make rational decisions and planning because if, for example, when we get into a difficult situation and we start hyperventilating, and all hyperventilating means that it's not that we're having an acute hyperventilation attack. It just means that our breathing gets a little bit faster and harder. The brain interprets that the body is under threat. And when the brain interprets the body is under threat, the brain is here to protect the body. And all the brain wants to do is to get you to hell out of that situation. Sure. It's not a time for planning. And it's kind of ironic, Bob, the time that we need to have 100% of brain function, we don't when it's a difficult situation. Right. And this determines a leader because a leader is, can be recognized by how well they do when there is a difficult situation. You know, if you think of a football game, for example, right. Um, the leader is the person when, when the team is losing the match and you've got one individual in the team and regardless of what's happening, that individual is still able to rally the troops and get the motivation going, get the team back on board. That's a leader. And really about changing, being able to change our states will give us a, our ability to remain composed in a difficult situation. It's a good place to be. Well, one thing I found, um, and I'm sure you'll agree with this, is I've I found that my blood pressure has also dropped. Um, Your buttons from it's dropped about 15 points. I mean, and it's the only thing I, I changed was the the tape of the mouth at night, and so it. Uh, and yes, we'll talk about anxiety too in the, the vagus nerve. Um, maybe if you want to mention now. Um, to see where people, you know, first off, I want to make sure that everybody knows we, we're covering a lot of information here and that it's going to be, a, you know, it might be to your advantage to grab one of uh, Patrick's books because he's, he's, you know, takes the time and, and explains all what he's doing over today. But um, 
maybe if you want to talk about the bolt exercise and oh yes yes and, and yeah so level test yeah so the bolt is we we call it like the body oxygen level test just so they can people can remember it and um, this gives you it's a good indicator of how well or how poorly an individual is breathing and this is when you're sitting down for about five minutes and you're resting and you're better off doing it in the comfort of your own home where you don't feel any psychological pressure. And to take a normal breath in and out through your nose and pinch your nose and hold your nose and time it in seconds, how long does it take until you feel the first definite desire to breathe? And then to let go, to breathe in through your nose. You're breathing at the end of the, the bolt score or you're breathing at the end of the breath hold time. It should be normal. So I'll just repeat that again. So you're sitting down, you have normal breathing for a few minutes. You take a normal breath in through your nose and a normal breath out through your nose. You pinch your nose with your fingers and you time it in seconds. How long does it take until you feel the first definite desire to breathe? When you let go, your breathing should be normal. That's now, a, what's Patrick, I, I do want to ask you about that because- uh, Sure. I, yeah, it's a little bit subjective because it is I feel bit, the yes. need to breathe. And I, you know, I can hold it longer, of course. And I mean, do I get to a point where I can hold it? Or I mean, I, I really had trouble with this. No, I, no yeah. I went to there's a couple of points, Bob. The one thing is that at the end of the breath hold, your breathing should be normal. So right. you shouldn't it, have to try and force it into sure. place. Gotcha. Otherwise, and, I was holding it too long. And the second thing is that normally the first definite desire to breathe, it corresponds with a, an involuntary contraction of the diaphragm. Gotcha. And so say, for example, so there's three things we could pay attention to. Number one, you're holding your breath until you feel the first definite desire or first stress to breathe. So that's going to be a cognitive feeling. Number two, you're holding your breath until you feel the first involuntary contractions of the diaphragm. And also when you resume breathing, your breathing should be fairly normal. And, you know, it is tricky enough to, you know, to be honest with you, but even if you get, get it fairly reasonably accurate, the main thing is not per se your number, but the real thing is, are you able to improve it? Gotcha. And so I'll give you this, some. Yeah. Sorry to cut across. I was just, just going to say, use the same technique every time, obviously. Yes, and, exactly. That's yeah. it. Yeah. And to give you some significance of it, the, there was a professor, Kyle Kiesel. He's a physical therapist from Evansville University. And he did a study that was published in 2018. He looked at 51 individuals. He looked at their breathing from a biochemical point of view and a biomechanical point of view and a psychophysiological point of view. And that's generally how researchers will investigate breathing. They will look at breathing across three dimensions. Out of the 51 individuals, only five of them had normal breathing. Only five. Mm. The rest of them either failed one dimension or all or two dimensions or all three dimensions. But his conclusion was, the bolt score is a good indicator of a person's functional breathing patterns. You don't have to measure the biochemistry, the biomechanics, and psychophysiologically. You simply measure breath hold time. And his conclusion was that if your breath hold time is above 25 seconds, there is an 89% chance that this functional breathing is not present. Now, he included four questions as well. Those questions were, do you feel tired? Do you feel tense during the day? Do you wake up with a dry mouth? And do you have cold hands? I wouldn't even worry about the four questions before because the four questions are common symptoms of hyperventilation. And what's the significance of a bolt score? Well, if you have a bolt score of say less than 20, 20 seconds, it will indicate that your breathing is a little bit faster a little bit up our chest, more likely to have a regular breathing, more likely to feel that you're not getting enough air, more likely to be breathless during physical exercise. Now, of course, 20 seconds is not too bad. 
in terms of functional breathing because you're heading close to 25. But earlier on, I spoke with COVID and I had a meeting last night with instructors, 60 of us met up via Zoom. And we spoke with working with a number of clients with long COVID. Some of these clients, their both scores are between three and five seconds. Oh, wow. They can't talk because they don't have the air. They don't have the air to complete a sentence. And all of the exercises that we do with them, we do breathing recovery exercises, starting them off because we we want to give them exercise that we're not going to tax the autonomic nervous system. They're not able to do slow breathing because if you're already feeling effortful breathing and if somebody starts saying to you, now I'd like you to slow down your breath, it's not going to happen. No, correct. So we do the small breath holds and the small breath holds may be just holding the breath for maybe one or two seconds to help stimulate the vagus nerve, but also to help with breathing recovery. And we do relaxation and we would even go as far as having them to do the breathing recovery exercises for five to 10 minutes every hour. So like the bold score is not perfect, but at the same time, I've used it with about eight, seven or 8,000 people. It, it gives us pretty good feedback. Sure. And um, so again, um, when you're talking about trying to correct the problem, one thing uh, I saw you mention is that you want to breathe, you know, less cycles per minute. And uh, like you said, that's very difficult. I found that very difficult to do. So like you recommended six cycles um, during a minute. Yeah. <laughs> and but th- I'm like, how do you do that? Term. <laughs> it's, it's okay. So what influences your bowl score is your tolerance to carbon dioxide because carbon dioxide is the primary stimulus to breathe. Right. An individual with a lower breath toll time normally has an increased sensitivity down to the accumulation of carbon dioxide. So a person with a lower boat score will find it more difficult to breathe slowly. Now, the reason that we have the resonance um, of six breaths per minute is because the research over the last, so this is only looking at one dimension, like this is looking at influencing the autonomic nervous system that the research over the last 30 years has focused in that an ideal respiratory rate to practice is between 4.5 to 6.5 breaths per minute and breathing at this rate will help to stimulate the vagus nerve and will help to strengthen the baroreceptors or the baroreflex so the baroreflex consists of baroreceptors or pressure receptors in the major blood vessels. Yes. And these pressure receptors are continuously monitoring our blood pressure. When our blood pressure increases, the baroreceptor sends signals to the blood vessels via the brain for the blood vessels to open up so that the blood pressure can come down. Gotcha. And conversely, somebody with lower blood pressure the baroreceptor should pick up that the blood pressure has lowered and the baroreceptors will send signals to the blood vessels via the brain for the blood vessels to constrict to normalize blood pressure. The sensitivity of these baroreceptors provides you very good feedback of the overall functioning of the autonomic nervous system. And if we can improve the sensitivity of the baroreflex, we can improve health we can help to bring a balance in the autonomic nervous system. Now, there's an interesting aspect of this. There's an Italian cardiologist called Bernardi, and I can send you on the papers later. He looked at um, different prayers from different faiths. And he looked at the rosary that's taken from the Catholic religion, and he sure. looked at yoga, yoga mantras. And when people were practicing the, the rosary or the different mantras, in yoga now he honed in on one in particular it naturally brought down the respiratory rate to six breaths per minute that's funny you say that i I had this amazing yeah i I know i had this sense that's part of what the rosary did is that the chanting and the the breathing and it was i I thought there was some benefit there beyond you know spiritual (laughs) so yes yeah i find it fascinating Yes, like, I, I absolutely, uh, you know, it, can, can you imagine that whoever was the creator of, of 
you know, the, the mantra, the rosary. Right. They were they were able to get it right down to that exactly. six perfect breaths per minute, the optimal respiratory rate. Now, I suppose some people are going to say, well, should I be breathing like this all day long? No, 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 no. You practice breathing like this for maybe 10 minutes twice daily. Gotcha. And if you do that, that will give you benefits, and those benefits will carry into your normal everyday life. I see. That helps a lot. <laughs> <'Cause> I thought, <laughs> oh, my gosh, I'm way off yeah. here, and I'll never get that. To, to well, and like, and you, the other thing that I'll say is that when you're practicing it, your breathing should be in and out through the nose, and your breathing should be silent. So because a lot of people, what they will do is they will start slowing down the respiratory rate. But in the process... They will be taking such full big breaths, but this will throw off their biochemistry. So there's always a balance. There's a balance between the biochemistry, the biomechanics, and the speed of your respiration. So that's why I use the acronym light, slow, and deep, because all too often with breathing, instructors will hone in on one dimension, but they ignore the others. So say, for example, you might have a physiotherapist who's focusing on the biomechanics. You might have a heart math instructor who's focusing on resonance frequency breathing. Mm -hmm. A buteco instructor, my background is focusing primarily on the biochemistry. But breathing is not just one dimension. And that's with the oxygen advantage. It kind of gave me the freedom to bring in anything outside of the tradition, because with breathing, it's very often taught according to a tradition. And this can be a little bit constraining because, you know, if you're taught by your master, you don't want to deviate outside of the Correct. teachings of your master because you might have a sense of betrayal. But it doesn't provide a breathing ground for learning because with breathing, the science is moving on all the time. And with the oxygen advantage, there was no tradition. There, there's no master, you know. Sure. We can look at breathing from so many different dimensions and it has gave us a tremendous freedom, but also, I suppose, a thirst for delving deeper into the whole application of breathing, because this is a vast, vast area. So again, I want to be very respectful of your time. Patrick McCowan, thank you so much. Again, check out his work at uh, oxygenadvantage.com. And uh, he's got many books. Um, is there one book you would recommend for the beginner or is it depending on what they're into? I've got a new one out. That it's called Atomic Focus. Oh, it's the, it's the most simplest one in terms of people who want to change states. Sure. Um, I think the breathing cure, I like the book, but I would say it might not be everybody's read because it's a little bit technical. But if you were to read the first two chapters, you'll get everything in the first two chapters. The first 100 pages contains 26 different exercises. And uh, it does, I suppose, women's breathing, Bob, which has been overlooked, the symptoms of PMS. Sure. You know, helping people with, with diabetes, both type 1 and type 2. And there's a good lot of research that came out of Italy over it the last 20 years in that epilepsy giving people some forms of epilepsy are brought on by um, some seizures are brought on by hyperventilation asthma sleep apnea children's development so i suppose if people want sports performance it would be the oxygen advantage yes yeah. if you want to delve into health it's going to be the breathing cure and if you want to delve into improving concentration and focus and attention span it's the book Atomic Focus. And I'll tell you, I, I just, uh, as a personal testimony, this is not hyperbole, hyperbole. I mean, this is, it's crazy how much uh, breathing could change your life and your health. So thanks again, Patrick McCowan, for being on. Love to have you anytime. Um, and uh, again, make sure you check out his books and his uh, website. Well, down below too listed. So. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Pleasure.